You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast, and I have Dr. Samantha Nazareth. Um, she's double board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology slash hepatology. She practices in New York City. Uh, she's a noted researcher, writer, and speaker on nutrition, wellness, and the microbiome. And uh, she's has had research published in the New York Times, and she's sought by media as an authoritative source on a wide range of topics that include eating, wellness, and gut health. She's been featured on CNN, Huffington Post. U.S. News and World Report, Women's Health, and many other places that I've ever been featured. So that's excellent. So, uh, Samantha, thank you for coming. How are you doing? I'm <laughs> great. That's excellent. Thank you for that lovely intro. Yeah, I once told the guests that uh, they had been featured on Oprah 34 more times than I had. They had never been featured on Oprah, so I thought that was funny. <laughs> I would love to put that in my bio at some point. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about um, about your work. What what attracts you to learning about the microbiome and gastroenterology and all the work that you do? Oh, yeah. I guess I'll start with um, gastroenterology, or as it's known in some circles, GI, gastro, all of the above. I had a love for the insides of people at a very, very young age. Uh, sounds very creepy, but I, I definitely was the, the little person always on, um, you know, using that operation game and even like on school trips going to like museums and whatnot. I was in gift shops buying skeletons that you can create and build and put organs inside and also like even eating breakfast on top of placemats with organs all over the place. So it wasn't needless to say, I think nobody in my family was that surprised when I went into medicine. But right. even before that, like I did um, it was like a summer program in high school and I had a really cool opportunity to, to even do like anatomy physiology at a medical school level. So I was able to start dissecting on human cadavers at like 15, 16 years of age. And I was always like wow. the first person to say, give me the scalpel. Like I, I want, I do right in. I, I was never afraid. I was always curious about understanding what was not seen you know typically because that that was like the most interesting thing is like what what's happening inside the enigma of our bodies and you know I entered medical school with the thought that I would become a surgeon which you know made a lot of sense given all of those interests that I had and during yeah. medical school yeah right like you know operation that's like real life operation and while I was in medical school my mom she got diagnosed with colon cancer so you know, with that, and I was pretty early on in, in my education, I learned so much about GI just because of the care that she was getting. And I really wanted to be well informed of what was happening. And I realized, oh, GI also, you know, I could work with my hands, I can see inside, and I love the guts. So it was, it was kind of a nice marriage of all of that. And it fell into place in um, sort of that timeline. And to answer your second question about microbiome, I really learned about it also when I was doing my GI fellowship in New York City at Columbia, 
the um, the fellowship program requires all of us to do research and identify a research mentor. And I mean, there are amazing, amazing people at Columbia. And one of them that I worked with was um, Dr. Peter Green, and he's very, very well known in the, the celiac disease space. And so he was my research mentor. And then we started doing um, some research on probiotics and celiac disease patients. And that led me to really, I had to really learn about probiotics. And that's really how I think the general public has become interested in the microbiome is because of the entrance of probiotics. And now everybody knows what a probiotic is. Back when I was doing this research, it was like, yeah, it was getting popular, but it wasn't so mainstream as it is now. Like, I, I mean, I see it everywhere, like even in food and cosmetics. It was only a supplement back then. And now it's just completely mainstream. So what is your uh, research turn to? What are you working on lately? You know, I, I'm more clinical now. I used to do a lot more okay. back then, but now I, it's, it's straight. I'm just like, you know, the doctor that you see in the office. Um, seeing patients and doing procedures and clinical care at this point. Okay. So what um, what's the focus of your clinical work? Do you see people with, you know, gastrointestinal distress? Uh, you know, what kind of issues are you commonly getting in clinics? Then? I see just about everything you could imagine with GI and bread and butter. And that usually, I would say like the top things that I see are bloating, gas, constipation. Mm-hmm. I would put that in like one category. Uh, A lot of acid reflux for heartburn, and then also just bleeding, like anything related to hemorrhoids, bleeding, pain, anything down there, essentially, those are probably the top three things that I would see on a a majority on a day-to-day basis. Mm. Yeah, one thing interesting I've seen with bloating and, you know, gas and all that, um, you know, a lot of people seem to be prescribed proton pump inhibitors, and it Mm -hmm. seems to be the opposite of what actually works. I had uh, one, one nutritionist that um, recommended I you know, take tablets of HCL. You know, it was literally like not pure hydrochloric acid, but it essentially would increase the stomach acid. Mm-hmm. And he told me that a lot of the proton pump inhibitors and, you know, Maalox and things like that, they decrease stomach acid, which makes it even harder to digest things. So it's going the wrong way. And I noticed, like, for instance, when I would take, you know, these HCL tablets, that it would help much, much more to, uh, you know, when I had stomach distress, I mean, obviously changing the diet would be far better, but at the, at the time, uh, it was just one interesting thing that I saw. So I don't know if, but uh, I guess I'm just yeah, telling you what I, I see, but what, what are some interesting know, things that you run into? It, but even along with that, because I get this question a lot with specifically acid reflux, is this too much acid, too little acid? And you're referring to betaine with pepsin, which is something yes. that you basically are giving acid back in a setting where maybe your symptoms are from, you know, lower acid. And I always caution anybody who's taking that, you definitely have to be ruled out for ulcers. Like you cannot just throw in, you know, HCL or betaine with pepsin without knowing, you know, do I have ulcers or not? Because it, on the flip side, yes, proton pump inhibitors definitely have a and and then all the studies keep coming out more and more of long-term usage and all the side effects um, associated with them. But in the setting of a bleeding ulcer, this thing works and it works really mm-hmm. fast. If someone comes in to the hospital and they're bleeding from an ulcer, this drug is given IV. And I've seen this because I've literally have done an endoscopy in the beginning of this course of hospitalization um, and I've seen what the ulcer looks like. And then I've seen it a couple of days after, after they've been giving this IV, you know, proton pump inhibitor, and it, it heals it. I mean, very, very quickly, not completely, I would say, but it does in that. And it, it's again, like you have to be very um, personalized when giving any yeah. drug or any supplement. It doesn't, it's not a blanket recommendation like, hey, if you have this, this equals that. But I've seen, especially in bleeding ulcers, that drug, it, it works. And yeah, what, I think, what I think has happened over the course of, you know, several years is that, you, you know, there's, there's a subset of patients that end up in the hospital. And then basically after they stay on the, on the proton pump inhibitor because, you know, they've had ulcers, but 
now we're understanding with all the, the research that's been out that this is not just a benign drug, even though it is over the counter and people have access to it, but it's not completely benign that people actually have to come off the drug if it's not indicated or if, you know, a certain time period has passed. And that's yeah. definitely, definitely true, especially given the rise of like C. difficile and things that it's been linked to that, um, you know, is definitely concerning. So my job is usually to say, okay, do you have ulcers or not? Because that's a whole other set of treatment plan than if, it, if it's not, you know, you don't have stomach ulcers. And then we have to explore, yeah, what is your lifestyle like? And um, the biggest things are like eating late at night that I've seen is a huge thing and um, specific foods that can trigger it. But yes, yeah, that is a common thing that I do see. Yeah, what are, what are some of the causes, for instance, possible causes of acid reflux or bloating or abdominal pain after eating? Or, you know, in general, what are some a of big, the possible reasons for these things? Yeah, I, you know, I always try to rule out like the big scary thing. So, um, you know, having an ulcer obviously is, a, is not great and a big scary thing. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, you know, even infectious things that, pop up like H. pylori, even small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, which is not a true pathogen, SIBO as it's called, um, for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's really just almost like translocation or movement of the, the bugs that live in the colon to a different place and so the small intestine that they're not supposed to be there. But it kind of falls under that like bugs are where they shouldn't be or acting up those things have to be ruled out as well. And then, you know, if all of that is ruled out, then yeah, lifestyle factors like um, eating late at night, even certain foods that just take a long time to digest. Usually it's like fried fatty foods that just hang out in the stomach for a long time. And, I, and this I've always seen even doing really early morning procedures. Um, when I do an endoscopy, I obviously, you know, we tell people that they have to be without food for eight hours, but in some right. people, even eight hours, I can tell that they had pizza huh. from going yeah. inside. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, and it obviously doesn't look like, you know, a slice of pizza inside, but <laughs> I, I <laughs> imagine right. My surprise, like, Oh, I know what toppings you had last night. And what if you're <laughs> able to say that's from Delmonico's on 12th street. <laughs> exactly. Worse. Right. That would be, it would be completely creepy and um, the patient yeah. may be running away from me immediately. But every time I've seen something like that, it's always something fatty, greasy, pizza-like that they ate the night before, even despite clearing, you know, having the eight-hour window of not eating. So why do you think that happens? Why do, um, you know, those fatty, greasy fried foods do that? Why is the stomach emptying so slow? Like what's going on? You know, yeah, some, cause that. some people it's, um, you know, just generally, it is harder for not harder, but it is slower for that specific food category to pass through the stomach generally. But then if you add another layer of well, what makes it even more delayed or what makes the, the transit, that's like a fancy way of saying it, the transit time or the movement time of the intestine smaller. And biggest things I would say one is diabetes so if the sugar is is not controlled that heavily heavily affects transit time or the movements of um, the stomach and even you know further down in the colon and you can imagine like the sugar diabetics have nerve issues right like if you have tingling in the bottom of your feet what's called neuropathy it could affect your gut it makes sense because the gut has lots and lots of nerve endings and it's basically under control from these nerve endings to move so just like sugar high sugar can affect the nerves on the bottom of the feet they can definitely affect the nerves up and down the, the intestinal lining so there's that and then a big one that i see are so, medications well quick question so have you have, have people observed clinically that um People with diabetes tend to have, in general, slower gastric emptying and slower transit time through their digestive systems for any kind of food? Um, not all diabetics, but there is, yes. Um, and then that diagnosis is usually called gastroparesis. So, and that's something mm -hmm. that um, is, is well known within the medical community. Yeah. 
So maybe what happens in, you know, when food enters the stomach is that you said there's a lot of nerves there. Maybe there's signaling going on. You know, the stomach is analyzing what's in it, signaling mm-hmm. ahead uh, to the small intestine and you know, to the rest of the digestive tract and saying, you know, we're not going to send you anything for a while. We've got to eat away at this. We, got, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that that's going on? I mean, well, even from the, throughout the digestive tract. The minute that you know that food is coming, there's a whole coordinated system of eating from salivation to basically preparing for the entrance of food. So you have that, and then you also have the taste of food. Um, Obviously, you you even know, like, if someone's sugar is low, you give them some candy, and that just hits their tongue, and that immediately affects their sugar. So even the taste of food, your body is knowing, okay, what's it's going to come down and it really signals it as basically the macronutrients, which is carbs, fat, um, and protein. So your body is already aware of what's coming down. Now, the stomach's ability to stretch is also a signal to the brain. So if you think about it, like the stomach is kind of like the size of a fist sitting, but it does, it, it's allowed to stretch from that point, like from that little fist, you can stretch it like a balloon. If you just sent, I mean, you could see like those people that do all those, um, those eating contests. I mean, they can, they can eat a lot because our stomach is allowed to stretch a lot, but there's signals that go from that stretch to your, your brain to say, okay, stop, this is uncomfortable, I'm full. And even signals going down, like I'm still hungry. So there's this just constant communication from the minute that food is even presented or the thought that you're going to eat all the way down to as it enters down. And then even even as things are in the stomach, there's kind of a final sweep too called the MMC of the microeating motor complex. And it's like, I always think of this as, you know, the Roomba, those little cleaning things that you can yep. set, set free in your apartment. It's kind of like that. It's like, it's like the final sweep. Like it's, it's going to go around and like clean up the things that maybe you didn't see or just get, get everything down where it should be. It's like that. It, it's a final sweep of the digestive, you know, the stomach to move things, sweep them along into the small intestine. So you can see like all of that is so coordinated with nerves, pathways to the brain. And that is so coordinated in that sense that, you know, we don't think how hard it is to eat, but our bodies know how to do all this thing in the process. What do you think would happen if um, <clears throat> if I ate a, I don't know, a standard meal and then I looked at a piece of pizza and I, and I thought to myself, I'm going to eat that, I'm going to eat that. Do you think that just by doing that, my body may um, speed up the processing of the existing food in my stomach because it thinks that this other food's coming that's going to take a while to digest and take a lot of effort? I mean, what do you think that would do to me, uh, you know, in terms of how fast I digest? I don't, I don't think it would affect it. I'm just thinking like you could override your signals clearly if you're, you know, if, if you think and your body's like, I'm full, you could obviously override it because a lot of people make room for dessert. But I, I don't think the body would clear it faster knowing that the f- extra food is coming. I, you know, that, that's, that would be really hard to study, but. I don't think that it would do that. Yeah, I just wonder because, you know, again, you're, you're getting visual signals and like, you know, people will salivate before they eat or if they think about mm-hmm. food, like you said, it starts a whole chain of reaction. So there's a gut brain communication here that's happening. So yeah, I wonder if you eat a meal and you eat dessert first, what that would do to you versus eating the, uh, you know, the proteins and the, the carbs and all that stuff first. I just wonder what the, um, having this in the presence of that, having that in the presence of this or not in the presence of it. I would think that all those things would inform how you digest and maybe change it, but that's just speculation. Yeah. I mean, we know this from the the absorption of sugar, really. Like if, like you were saying, the dessert first. Like if you do dessert first with nothing in your stomach, the sugar does get absorbed faster than if you had something sitting in your stomach and then you had dessert. But in terms of digestion, there's really no, like, there's not like a quicker way to actually move things along. Let, you know, there are medications that could do that, but just from like a mind brain type trick, there's really none that can do that to make things move faster as you're eating. The other thing too is um, most people are rushing not really in that mind 
frame of I'm going to sit down and eat. And that, that kind of speaks to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And even with that, like the sympathetic is basically the, I, I got to do a lot of things. I got to, you know, check my iPhone. I got to do all these like tasks and read emails and everything. That's sympathetic. Before that, it was like, I'm going to be chased by like a tiger out of the cave. And then the parasympathetic is, okay, um, it's rest and digest time. It's time to eat. And and I have to admit too, I mean, I'm I'm probably not in a parasympathetic state every time I'm eating just because of, well, one, I'm in New York City, so it's really hard to do that. But you you understand what I mean in that sense. Yeah. And that yeah. that also affects digestion because you're not you're that parasympathetic sort of mind frame is helpful for digestion and the normal processes of digestion, which is different than sympathetic kind of mind frame, which is not meant to rest and digest. It's meant for you to like kind of be on adrenaline. Well, so, I mean, here we go. So now we are saying that uh, <clears throat> your mindset does affect, you know, your eating experience. So, oh, I mean, yeah. Have you, you know, have you seen any studies that, that show uh, eating with a certain mindset in a relaxed state and a stressed state? You know, I mean, I've experienced this myself. That I think mm-hmm. there's got to be a correlation. You know, if I'm stressed, I may not want to eat or I may want to eat. If I, you know, eating makes you feel better. Again, I may not want to eat when I'm stressed. Or if I'm stressed and I eat something, I may get indigestion when I normally mm-hmm. wouldn't. So it definitely does yeah. seem like, you know, the condition of your nervous system and your thoughts and, and all that affects, uh, you know, the digestion process. In that sense, yes. If you've already eaten and you're trying to trick your body into eating more, uh, that's a little bit harder to do because once you're kind of in, in the mode of eating, yeah, it's a little bit difficult. But yeah, before you eat, getting into that mind frame and even while you eat. And that's that's sort of something that we've kind of strayed so far from like eating in a group setting and taking the time, these more than half hour, even lunches, longer than that, like that, that's so rare now. Well, what about uh, physically what you're eating? So what happens if I eat, um, you know, a slow digesting, if I just eat meat, I just eat like a steak for lunch. That's it, nothing else, mm-hmm. versus a steak with like a big side of vegetables. You know, the vegetables, legend has it, digest a lot faster and move things through the digestive system faster than meat. So what happens if you have just meat or if you have meat and vegetables? What Does the combination of vegetables make the meat move through faster and therefore it's less digested than it otherwise would have been? Have you seen any studies that look no. at this? No, the only thing is really um, the feeling of fullness. Obviously, with the veggies, you're going to feel fuller a little bit faster than if you just had the meat, even though meat is on itself is full. It's pretty filling. Um, but in terms of movement, it's really shown it, specifically for vegetables because that really highlights fiber that, yes, if you have fiber in your diet, then your transit time more so than um, kind of the downstairs portion like the colon is. Um, faster just because it helps move things along but in terms of like affecting absorption no but it will help move things along if you have fiber added oh all right so what about uh yeah why why would it help things along if you have fiber added or if i'm going to take a probiotic should i take it before my meal after my meal during my meal and why Mm -hmm. would one of those ways be better than the other so yeah probiotics so this is um it's interesting because one there's been some studies that show that even the probiotics that you take don't even stick around so it's one of those things of um you know does it make a difference of when you eat it or when you take the supplement perhaps you know and then some people would say well then you should take it like last thing before you go to bed because then you're not really bombarding your your probiotic that's there with food um i always just tell people just read the label and just follow it because there's so many different kinds out there and at this point i don't know what's going to stick around in your gut the the mechanism that probiotics are thought to work is perhaps um in small subsets they do, you know, stick around and then another, they kind of pass through and interact with the microbiome that currently exists and then exit, you know, as you flush the toilet. So, you know, does it matter then what, what time of the day with food, without food, I would say just follow what's labeled on the, on the bottle, because um, it depends on how they've manufactured it to be delivered inside of, inside the body. And now that there's so many different forms of probiotics i can't even just say it's a pill form i mean there's powders and 
there's liquids, there's everything. So it's, it's even harder to kind of say that in a broader sense. Sure. Well, what are, what are some of the big questions that you want to have answered, you know, in your clinical work? What, what are some of the frustrations you wish they were an answer to or more insight into? I really would, because I know how hard it is to study the microbiome in itself. And this research is really, really new and early. I the question I get a lot, and and I, of course I'm thinking about is is there really will will we ever get to the point where we could say what a normal microbiome really is, and also are we really sampling the right part to to really get a, like a snapshot of a patient or even an individual of the microbiome? Because right now it's basically the the last half of the colon because that's what we poke out and that's what's really accessible. But is this the microbiome that's really the most important, or is it more like a deeper one, you know, in the mucus layer, or even more in the mucosa layer, which would require a biopsy? Um, where, because I, in different parts of even the colon, there's different bugs that live in different areas, and which area for which disease is really most important? And how are we able to follow that over time? Because anything can change that microbiome. Perfect example is antibiotics. So if you have antibiotics, what was shown before the antibiotics is going to be completely different after. And, and you know things like that. I think we have to get to a point where um, the data from the microbiome can become useful in a way that we can personalize medicine, especially for me for GI medicine, to say, okay, your microbiome is like this, and if we manipulate it in a certain way to affect change, it's going to be like this, and these are the results you're going to get. I mean, that's that would be really cool for me because then we're really moving away from pharmaceuticals and highly, highly personalized, in some circles call it precision medicine, but very individualized, personalized care based on basically just your bugs and the bugs that have been living with you. Yeah. Do you know of any research that you're waiting to hear the results of that uh, <clears throat> would shed light on some things you're interested in? I love, I, I really like the whole fecal transplant space, and there's a lot of clinical trials that are being done outside of C. difficile. So at this point, the only FDA-approved um, indication for fecal transplant, that's literally just transferring poop from one person to another, is for C. difficile that hasn't really responded to any antibiotics. But of course, you know, now that microbiome is all over the news, it's really linked to everything else too outside of the GI tract. I mean, it's been linked to mental mental illnesses, um, also cardiovascular disease, metabolic diseases, so much more beyond that, that you have to wonder, well, if the obvious question is, if you just transfer a healthy person's poop into a um, someone who wants to change one of these things, well, what would happen over the long term? And even beyond that is how do we affect people when they're first born? Because that's when we know that the microbiome is changing like heavily, 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 and becomes more stable later on in life. So it's like twofold. It's, can we do something if someone is an adult and manipulate that? And is fecal transplant the way to go? And if so, then, you know, we have to wait for the studies from the clinical trials to come out to say that, one, this does affect something and it's safe. I mean, those are the biggest things that it's efficacious and it's safe. And then also, you know, what population can this be applied to? Um, that's really, it's, it's really necessary to get the, that kind of data. Is how, how many people, you know, how, how many um, participants were in a study like that? And can this be applied to everyone or is it supposed to be applied to just certain people? And it's so new in that sense, but that's something that I'm looking forward to, to see the clinical trials that are doing fecal transplants outside of that indication of C. difficile. Mm, yeah. Now, that would be interesting. I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot to figure out. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've heard that the, it's not just the microbiome in our, you know, in our guts. I mean, there's a virome, there's a parasite, oh, yeah. there's fungi, there's yeast. I mean, there's, there's so much Ar in there. Archaea. No really yeah. Works. And I think it, it's just, I, it's a really beautiful story, I think, of the microbiome that we have. If you think about it, these bugs have been on this planet for way longer than 
human race entered sort of the existence of the existence of Earth and how, you know, our species has have evolved with these organisms that have been here before. They're, you know, they they're way more adaptable than we are. They change, they cross, like they share DNA with each other. It's it's quite incredible how um crafty the microbes are, but that we don't we're not it's not just us that we evolved with them. And they're sort of this entity that now has become into light of, oh, wait, maybe maybe we shouldn't just um, kill, like bugs are all evil and that all of them have to be eradicated, um, but that we have to foster this other, these organisms that we're all host to in a good way, because one, it affects our health. And two, it affects even generations beyond that and everybody around us, too, because, I mean, we share bugs with each other, especially like you can imagine with spouses and partners. So it's this idea that we're not we're not just um, a species that's a species alone, but we also have evolved with all of these other organisms in a very beautiful way in order to survive and mate. I mean, that's really, that's the goal of the microbes too, is survival and propagating the DNA into the next generation. Very good. So what's the best way for people to, uh, you know, I guess if they're local to you, they can come see you, but uh, how can they find out more if they have, you know, a gastrointestinal problem or if they want to learn more about the, you know, the microbiome or gut health? Any recommendations oh, yeah. in general? I, you know, the American Gut Project is um, spearheaded by uh, Rob Knight and some other great researchers like Jack Gilbert, too. I even just started there. I, I became a citizen scientist. I submitted my poop that way and, and started learning. And I like that it's let researcher-led and it's open source and it's really kind of forwarding the science of microbiome. So that's that's kind of like one thing is like as as kind of a regular person, what can I do to forward this research? And then two, I um, for me personally, I mean, I have a website. It's dr like Dr. Sam Nazareth, S A M Nazareth, like you know N A Z A R E T H dot com. Um, that's where you can find like information on some articles that I've written and um, contact for my practice. But just generally, the microbiome space. There's so much out there, but even contributing to science and by the data, because that's really what we need is more data and how that fits into the bigger scheme of things. It's really, really important. Very good. Well, Sam, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.